What's going on people? Welcome to Big Foe Nation, where I use my own reason to take on what I consider to be the bad ideas of the day. And if you like my presentation at the end, like, share, and subscribe so you can help me grow the channel. And if you don't like what I'm saying, then also leave a comment, tell me why, make an argument against my argument. I'm open to uh, hear what you got to say and I'm likely to even maybe respond back to you. All right, so today we're going to be speaking about an argument that Sam Harris made. Now, this is an argument that he's made before, an argument about free will. This time it was called his final thoughts on free will. So I got a lot to say about this uh, presentation that he made. First, that this new argument that he is making is a very old argument and I feel that the way that he presented it was kind of a misrepresentation of the two factions that actually exist. The two factions that he's describing as being at war with each other, I would consider the same faction. And the opposing faction is the one that I don't think he mentioned at all. So for a very long time, you could say maybe, you know, <laughs> two th more than 2,000 years, there has been going on a uh, fight between two ways of looking at the world. One way of looking at the world says that the only way that you can understand the world and the best way to go through trying to understand the world is through experience. Those people generally, you can look at them as being the empiricists, but there's a lot of other groups that have derived from that. These are basically the Aristotelian types or people that are of the Aristotelian school. Experience is what we know to be the truth. So you use your sense perceptions to determine what is true and what isn't true. On the other side, you have what you could consider the Platonic school, where the belief is that your reason is the, actually the only way to determine the truth, and that your sense perception is actually often contradictory to the actual truth that you can only find through your reason. So you have one side that says experience is the way to go, the other side that says reason is the way to go. So Sam's argument, when he talks about free will, is the argument for experience being the determinant of everything, right? To the exclusion of reason. The interesting thing about his argument is that he, when talking about experience, includes reason within that experience. So by doing that, he's able to sneak away from all the contradictions within experience or all the things that would violate a concept that would say that experience is the only way to uh, to find the truth. He just takes the other side's argument and says, no, that's with us too. Then, and, you, and you can't do that. <laughs> and the other interesting thing is that the argument, the experience argument, the argument that experience is the way that we determine what is true is an argument, is a physics argument and a mes metaphysics argument, right? It's talking about like the, the concept of causality, right? And he's just, and with the way that he describes it, he's just saying, no, what, we're not going to talk about metaphysics. We're not going to talk about physics. We're just going to talk about experience. And yeah, the, the concept of experience was an elusive one because it, uh, the oddest thing about it, at least for me, was that after going through an entire argument about how, you know, even defining voluntary versus involuntary and all this other stuff and saying that we are no more in control of our lives than someone falling from a building, then is going to flip the argument right at the end when, when basically the audience would have to say, wait a minute, if you're saying we can't control anything and, um, you know, we're just basically like turn out the way that it should. And basically his answer to that was that no, because there's consequences. And it's like, consequences? So how would consequences endow you with an ability? If you can decide not to do something because of a consequence, then that means that you, could, you have the ability to decide or to choose, right? And the goalpost on choosing is so strange because he's trying to say that, yeah, you might choose, but you can only choose within like a limited scope. So because you can't choose things that you've never heard of or that you don't know, then you're not really choosing. So I guess he's saying in order to choose, you have to be all knowing. From the start of the argument to the end of the argument, he literally goes from saying that your life is something that you completely do not control. You are somebody falling out of a, out of a, out of a building and you can, you know, 
uh, comment on how the wind feels in your face but other than that you're just going with with whatever the you're going with the flow you're going with gravity but then by the end of it he's saying even in this context you can still choose your words carefully plan for the future reason effectively restrict your impulses so all of these things not only involve choices but involve lots of choices so I'm not sure if he's trying to say that what we have is that we can act in a voluntary way and that's not quite a choice um, but voluntary by definition is free will that's that's what voluntary is it's like to do an act of your free will is to do it voluntarily so anyways let's go through the points that he went through first he has you try to think of a movie and he's saying that you can't predict what movie you're going to come up with and you couldn't have picked some other movie that you didn't know and these are arguments that you don't have free will but there's a few things that he's missing even in that one when somebody asks you to do something in when someone asks me to do something in my mind i have to make a choice a do i want to listen to this person b do i want to do whatever they're saying that i should do and how it to what to what extent do I want to uh, go along with whatever game that they're doing? And then I have to ask my brain to go to the place that stores whatever those answers are and to give me the best one that I want, right? Or the one, the one that suits the situation. And he's saying that there's no possible explanation for why you chose that one. Maybe if you're just going by feelings and experience, there's no way to understand that. But what if you're going by reason? If you're going by reason, you would say something like the least action principle. And the least action principle would say that the fur, the, your brain, you asked, you asked your brain, you made a request to your brain to, to find me a something within this category. And it found the fast, it brought to you the fastest one that fit that category. So, you know, um, it sounds like he wants the brain to be a certain way and if it's not the way that he's describing it then it's then it's not free but uh if you use your reason then you could you can easily uh conceive of why it is that that was the one that you chose right the opposite side reason side but he's talking the experience side so he's not allowing you to use reason because he has a lot of names for reason in this scenario he would call reason um making up a story after the fact right because that's how he refers to it when he's talking about the people in the lab the next example again he's excluding reason when he's asking you to look for the watcher now who is the watcher other than the person doing the reasoning now if the if the reasoner the the one that can observe is observing its observance then what is it observing it's like uh it's reason that navigates your mental process so how with your feelings could you find reason he's saying if if you can't find reason with your feelings then it doesn't exist which makes no sense at all and that was the second one the watcher or that was that was the, that was his second example when he was asking you to look by feeling uh, if you can find where that reasoning is coming from. The other thing that he goes is that it's irreducibly mysterious now, and that your reasoning process is, uh, is irreducibly mysterious, or the part of the, the reasoning process of discovery is irreducibly mysterious. But that is, again, is changing the topic. So he's saying that your reasoning is something that I control. I control it in the sense that I direct it. And if it had a predetermined outcome that I already knew before it got there, the way that he's talking about it, then what would thinking even be? Why do I need, if, if, if I could, before I asked my brain to give me an answer within a concept, if I already knew which answer it would give me within the concept, why would someone think? That doesn't make any sense. Where, where the free will is, is in my ability to ask my brain to call up that concept or call up another one or test this one against another or call up three of them or do whatever it is that, that, you, that you do when you're reasoning something. But whether or not the, the, the process of concept generation is itself uh, mysterious, you're still controlling it, you're still directing it, you're putting, you're telling it where it should be directing its focus. It's like a machine that you're holding. <laughs> right? You don't, you, when I, when I pull the trigger in the gun, I'm only pulling the trigger. I'm not doing all the work inside the machine, but I'm, st but I'm still the one who's doing it. Just because I'm not micromanaging every step of the way does not mean that I'm not the ultimate cause of it. And I'm, and, and, and intended cause of, I'm choosing to be the cause of it. 
The other part that is also strange is the, the idea of, be, of being a slave to reason as another argument saying that you, you do not have free will. Now, and the, the hardest part for me to handle about this one is because one, I'm making a, a video argument against what he's saying because the reason in it does not follow with my reasoning. He's saying that the only reason that he's trying to convince people of this reason is because you cannot resist it. He could not resist it, therefore they will not be able to resist it, right? But I'm rejecting it. I'm not resisting it. I'm rejecting it because I'm recognizing it and I'm recognizing it as an argument that failed in times before. And this version of the argument is worse than the other versions because it's contradicting itself. Where the other ones, they, they describe the universe that ended up being like, a horrible universe and then they would at the end of it make some excuse so for him reason is an automatic thing it just it's true on its face no one can resist it it just goes automatically into your brain there's no process um that's determined by the individual or if it is determined by the individual it's predetermined by the individual but it's just a strange way to to say that you're not free because it's like reason is a tool that I'm using and I'm free to use it as I wish to use it. Now, the fact that I can't already know the answer that I'm going to reason out before I do so, it seems like a strange uh, way to measure it. Um, the example that he has about the Mandarin, uh, about learning Mandarin, right? He's saying like, you can't change what you want to do, but you can change what you want to do if you're motivated to change what you want to do, like all the classical dramas and oral histories and of you know West Africa, I can know for sure, and uh, the Greek uh, mythology, things like Homer, Aeschylus, things like that. They're based on the idea that you can create a drama that's going to change the population, or they wouldn't have created them, right? On um, in 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 Greece, they say the 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 characters die, so we don't have to and in 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 the west african tradition is we kill the ideas we that that need to die the old ideas that need to die so how do we actually get the two factions of one side saying that we only deal with experience and then the other side saying we deal with reason just so we can have some place to place his argument so the concept that socrates tried to articulate or did articulate and plato articulated and uh, Aristotle made a red, uh, a straw man argument against, right? So their argument is an argument that anyone that understands any uh, math or physics or anything like that or calculus, you know, you understand the, uh, the concept of a function. Now, if you want to think about the discovery that Socrates made, the idea of there being some sort of a unity that exists beyond all variability and change. That is, that you can get a multiplicity out of a unity. That is, a, is the concept that the people that believe that only in experience, they don't believe in such unities. And they find all kinds of ways to argue against that unity. Unfortunately for the, the people that came up with the concept of unity, that unity has also been the foundation of religion. That is how they, that, that is, that is the truth that they are based on, that, that, that the concept of that unity. And, and that being a university law, universal law, that multiplicities come from unities. So if you're going to take the concept of, let me just play it out, just in case there are people that don't know. If you're going to take the simplest function that you can think of, the x squared function, parabola. So you can go to infinity, anywhere that you're going down along the, uh, along the x domain, you can go to infinity in either direction, right? And you know that symbol. And that symbol represents every place on that graph. No matter what place on that graph, with, no matter which direction you're going, that X represents any one of those numbers that you want to choose it to be. So you have one thing that represents every possible thing in, within a certain category. So that is the simple concept. But the part of them that's the same in the X squared, right, is the squared, right? So that squared is the unity that exists beyond all variation or change. And the X is the possibilities of the changes or all the all possible potentials of change. So everything that can be represented by the X, they really have no rep, they have no connection to each other at all, except for the fact that they're all connected by the, the X squared, by the squared, right? So what's acting on them is the same. 
They're all being acted on in the same way. That's what connects them, not any relationship between them. Take the numbers themselves. What's the relationship between one and two? Nothing. What's the relationship between two and four, or four and, you know, 16? What's the relationship between those numbers? Some, some of those numbers will have relationships, but if you keep going all the way down, there's not going to always be a relationship. And the relationships between one is not going to be the same relationship as the next one, right? What's the, rela the relationship between one and two is not the same relationship as between two and four, right? Or between four and nine, right? So their relationship comes from the thing that's acting on all of them right? And the squared is the thing that's acting on all of them. So that's a quality that they all have. They all have this quality. So what Aristotle argues against is that he says that that quality is some physical thing because he says there's relations, there's, um, which we just said, they're not related to each other. They're related to the concept. Uh, he says there's relations, there's substance, and there's quality. <laughs> right? But he doesn't argue against quality, and quality is the one that he should be arguing against, right? So because he says that there is no, uh, he says that the, that the crucial one is substance, then he argues against the substance. So he says, if there's one substance that represents all substances, if, if, if the set, if the set is a substance as opposed to a quality, then that substance couldn't simultaneously be itself and be in all of the members of all of the elements in the set. So yeah, but that's not so, but that's not the argument that Socrates was making. Socrates was saying there's a quality that all of them have. So all of the members of the set are related to, all of the elements in the set are related to the set by a quality that the set is. So the set is just that quality, right? And the elements are those that possess that quality. That's how you can have a multiplicity. But the people, so these multiplicities or these unities that uh, the multiplicities are derived from, you find them in reason. So that's where the Plato and, and all the people that followed that reasoning uh, school believe. The other people don't believe that there is unities. They say that you can only use your sense perception, your experience to study particular things and that you, those particular things you cannot associate with, as Sam Harris says in this, imaginary, intuitive, whatever. So you can't imagine connections between particular things. That's what they're believing. So he's trying to make it seem like, yeah, I'm including reason. He's not including reason, even though he's saying he's including reason. Reason is something you cannot simultaneously say the world is all experience and then say, uh, I, I believe in reason, right? So the, pe the people that, that believe that exclusively in, in experience are against the people that believe in reason. Right? So he's not a representative of reason. Even the way he describes his own mind, it's clear that he's actually describing it the way that the experience school describes it. He describes your, your mind as something just where the, where the ideas just come out, right? There, because he's saying that each idea is not related to the next idea. I just finished telling you when I said the, the x squared that the individual numbers are not related to each other, they're related to the squared. Right? So in the same way, thoughts are not related to each other, they're related to the concept. So whether I say this thought and then that thought, it's not that one thought generates the next thought. And, be and if I can't find a connection between the two thoughts, then there's no me. That's not the way it works at all. It's that I have a concept that's generating a multiplicity of thoughts, right? That's the bonus. So I can say, hey guys, this is the domain and then they will generate all the concepts that are involved in that, right? So yeah, so he's trying to take all of the contradictions that, that the uh, experience view of the world, that's the David Hume view, that's the Aristotle view, that's the uh, Jeremy Bentham view, that's the Adam Smith view, all of, the, all of these people that believe experience, sense perception, uh, objective, only fact, non-subjective, those people believe in experience and they got to wear that hat. They don't get to, oh, well, I believe in Plato too. No, <laughs> that's a dead giveaway <laughs> when, you, when, when someone's talking about experience being the main thing. That's like, that's like their, that's the symbol. <laughs> so no. And the way that he describes reason is not reason. So save it, okay?
um, your your mental process is not just a, 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 a bunch of disconnected thoughts that have no unifying principle. You're the unifying principle and you know that and he knows that because he keeps talking about how we can still do voluntary things and you know choose our words correctly and plan for the future and reason and res and restrict our impulses these are he's arguing against himself but his way of kind of getting around it is by saying that your reason is not all your 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 control of reason is not all knowing so one you don't you can't predict your thoughts before you think them even though you're generating the context that they can come out right if somebody asks me what's my favorite color i don't say hot dog Right? So I say something <laughs> like I, I, I choose to limit my brain in some way. And I'm not just a robot. It's not like you just said something that it just goes into my brain and comes out with something. Right? I'm mediating that process. And there's no way to argue that you're not. So that's why hey, his argument has to change so much, right? Whether he's talking about, you know, uh, you know, in the beginning, he's saying, just experience. Just tell me what you're experiencing. What are you feeling? So if you're talking about what you're feeling, that's the experience camp. Obviously, reason is not active in that. So the question is, what do you think about, you know? So it's, it's, he's very careful to say, like, you know, to say imagination instead of reason. When he says, every time he said imagination in that video, he, he was talking about what I'm talking about as reason and what Plato meant by reason and what, uh, you know, all the really good scientists meant by reason, you know, before there was a, 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 a artificial split between subjective and objective investigation. And he technically says his argument doesn't change anything. And I agree in a way because his argument kind of, it argues against itself right because he's trying to have it all by being at once the 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 ex representing the people that say your sense perceptions and you know only correlations we cannot make uh there are no underlying principles that are discoverable to us he's in this camp but that camp has been defeated so many times and their ideas are so irrational that the only way for him to resurrect this idea is to smuggle in ideas that come from the other side that are the contradictory ideas so he's not making a metaphysical physical argument because that would reveal what the argument is and it's an argument that has already been defeated the funny thing is plato defeated it before aristotle uh not well at least socrates defeated it before aristotle does the did the rebuttal because the parmenides dialogue where he actually stars aristotle in the dialogue he, he lays out this same argument, but it's in the negative. So it's like there, it's like a horror show, right? You're going through it and it's horrible. And they come to a horrible conclusion when they follow this concept. So there's no way to follow this concept without going to some horrible conclusion. But every one of these guys, when they come to a horrible conclusion, then they want to get out of jail free card. And in this case, it was just like, oh yeah, I said that you're not in control of everything. You're just basically falling from the ground, falling from a, like a person falling from a building. But you can still reason, you can still choose things, you can still, you know, that doesn't, those, you know, he wants to have it every way. So either he's saying nothing, he's saying you can still reason and choose and do everything that we would understand as free will, but he's going to call that something else because of how much micromanaging you can do of it, if that's what he's saying. Or the other way, he's not, he's not admitting that he's making the argument that he's making, which is that there is no reason. So like, that's what makes it weak. The other people like the David Humes of the world, at least that part of their argument is probably what, what allows it to stay so long is that they were at least committed to it to all, all the way through. They hate reason. They don't let, agree with the soul. They don't think that people can think and that's, they stay over there. But he wants to have it both ways by saying you can still plan and stuff like that. They're actually saying that you can't do that kind of stuff. They say you gotta depend on other things like your, your animal instincts or your friggin' customs and habits. They give something to lean on where he's saying, no, you can lean on your reason, which is like, that's what we were saying. <laughs> we're saying you can lean on, our, on your reason. We're saying that experience will not tell you anything. We're saying that experience will confuse you most of the time. Right? And most of the great discoveries were not made by experience. They were made by people that were, that were looking at what they, what they were experiencing and seeing some concept that was, that was saying that the, that the experience was misleading.
right? There's nothing about perception. Uh, the, the, the concept that, that, uh, that Kepler came up with, Tycho Brahe came up with, and all these different people came up with, their concepts from a sense perception perspective are identical, right? But some of them are wrong, right? The, the, the concept behind them is wrong. And the only way to find that is by reasoning, right? He did that, Kepler did that before we could go to space, right? We, ha we had telescopes, but the kinds of predictions he was making, like that there would be an exploded friggin' planet where we have the asteroid belt and things like that, he couldn't have known those things other than just his reasoning, which was a concept of how the whole solar system was laid out like a harmonic system of how the you know the extreme parts of each orbits like the ratios between them and that was what he was saying was like that that it was laying out in a, in a musical that the form of it was musical right and that's not uncommon thing if you look at things like the golden mean right if you look at how the 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 the, the original musical scales are created they're created geometrically in in a way that's uh, coincides with the uh, with the geometric mean, so so they don't get to have it both ways. <laughs> I would say to Sam is you cannot remix Aristotle's argument. Okay, there's no remixing it. Dave, uh, John Locke tried; it was horrible. Locke, Leibniz came and destroyed him. Friggin' uh, David Hume tried. All these guys keep trying, and the other scientists will continually come along and destroy this same argument. There's no way to just, I know there's so much of it that you just want to keep, but you can't. It doesn't work. Reason is a thing. We control it. It has the ability to, deter, to, uh, to discover the, the lawful orderings of the universe, okay? And uh, that's where I'm standing. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna honestly stand there. I'm not gonna try to have it both ways, okay? But if you're gonna talk about experience, you don't get to count reasoning and all the parts that go with reasoning in that as a grand category, as, as your answer to all the holes in the argument, right? So that's, it's kind of like you're moving the goalposts, right? So make an argument make if you if you want to make a better argument <laughs> so that this universe that he's describing is a horrible one and there's no way that he can justify saying that reasoning is in that universe because the stuff that he's describing it does has no resemblance to reasoning right that's like that's like a crucial p reasoning uh concept it's like the original reason <laughs> so you you can't you can't be somebody that calls yourself like uh someone that knows how to apply the socratic method and then you don't believe in unity like that's that's like a core concept that you don't get you don't get to not believe that concept because it's the uh it's the foundation axiom so you're for it or you're not it, it, in a sense it's a religious concept but uh it's one, it's, it's one that is made by reason and that, that is very difficult to reason against. So I think that's why he's not reasoning against it. He's kidnapping it and, and, and saying and picking it on his team so he doesn't have to fight it. But uh, no, I'm not going for that. You're, trying, you're making the, the experience argument, then make the experience argument. And that experience argument is the adversarial argument to reason. It's basically the, the, the polemic against reason, right? So you can't just cherry pick parts of it and be like, okay, well, this is, this is, the, new, this is the new theory when all the axioms that lead to your theory are still the same. <laughs> so um, David Hume was wrong and Sam Harris is also wrong when it comes to free will. And if you disagree, let me know in the comments. Love to hear from you. If you agree, like and share. And until next time, I am Big Foe. This is Big Foe Nation. Peace out. I've been down this road before, but now I got my shit together for sepa, for deba. Possibly the worst part is the morality. The experience faction should never talk about morality because it sounds crazy. Even when it sounds logical, it sounds crazy. Or even when it's rationalized well, it sounds crazy. He's saying that the benefit of believing what he's talking about is that it absolves ma bad actors of the, of the uh, you know, the consequences of their actions. Why, how is that a good thing?
You know, we can already, the compassion that he's describing, we should already have that compassion. We should already be not judging the people, but judging the actions, right? What we want to stop is the action. So now we're not going to care about the action anymore because it's predetermined. That, you really have to intellectualize yourself mentally masturbating without contacting your anyone or even your own thoughts for a long time to come up with that because that uh, doesn't fit in any context yeah had to add that in because <laughs> the video would not have been complete if i didn't add that part <laughs>